In the early days when people just started making Delta Sigma converters, or Sigma Delta converters, some people call them Delta Sigma, Sigma Delta. But the thing is, okay, one bit converters that were made, they used to have these things known as idle tones or chirping. They actually sounded like, like birdies. What a birdies, when you take the output of the early converters and boost them up digitally, say, uh, 60 dB or 80 right, dB, so I you remember can this hear noise. the noise floor. Yeah, the anomalies, so the yeah. noise floor uh, anomaly, I mean, it's not really his, it was like it would have this birdie, right. uh, idle noise is so-called, right? Uh, and, and that would change with temperature and biasing conditions on the chip. So they found that adding dither, adding noise into the converter, into the modulator, uh, actually improved that because it broke up the tendencies of such converters to fall into repetitive patterns which is what you hear when it falls into this repetitive modulation patterns, this, this birdies and chirping. So there's, there's an example when adding noise into a converter chip actually linearizes the chip or rather breaks up uh, these patterns, behavior these loops or patterns yeah, right, I mean, right. That, that, that are caused. Now, modulators we use now are more sophisticated, but there is still a need uh, to add certain amount of dither or random noise into the converter chip. So I, I speculate that a properly controlled jitter that arises when the equipment is hooked to uh, a proper master clock generator such as ours actually serves further to randomize or certain fixed patterns and makes it sound more natural, more analog-like. Are we making the circuit act a little more human? Is that sort of uh, fair to, to, to try to, to analogize it that way? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing because, you know, we all know digital process is a little bit artificial. You know, you're taking what is a continuous process and you're taking, you know, you're sampling it at points. And it turns out that there is a little bit of uh, interesting factor involved as to how to how to do such sampling and more importantly the circuits that do that sampling it seems that if you if you add certain right kind of noise and right kind of jitter now we have to be very careful when it I, I mean I shudder every time I say the word jitter because most people think that means the horrible jitter sound but it, but jitter in, in, in a broad sense in a scientific sense in other words modulation of the clock when the right kind of modulation of the clock is added, then it turns out that it smooths over those typically digital edges. It takes the digital edge off. So jitter's been getting a bad rap all these years. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, it, again, it, it's a good thing and a bad thing, as the Greek saying is that the difference between a medicine and a poison is just the amount. <laughs> so you got to think about that. So in a sense, the issue is. Uh, you know, is, it, uh, is aspirin a, a medicine, is it a poison, I mean, so many things, arsenic, you know, so many things have been used to, to benefits. So modulating the clock or actually introducing some sort of a deviation of a clock in a controlled way, in a proper way, with the proper characteristics, so, something our equipment does, turns out to actually create more uh, analog or a lifelike sound. Again, um, I mean, it's true of any art form, uh, or say, for example, music, you know, uh, music is the art of control, uh, of, of variations, of modulations. You want, uh, certain passages have to be faster, others have to be slower. Some have to be quieter, others have to be louder. So what we do is we have a control. Uh, our circuits have absolute control over the amount of jitter and the type of jitter. That's why we use the oven control. So on the one hand, we, are, we start out with extremely low jitter because our own internal oscillators are extremely well stabilized. Or we the atomic ovens, clock. Or, or we use the atomic clock. So we start out with, uh, with a perfectly stable, uh, stable source, yeah. source. And now through a 64-bit controlled process, we again decide what aspects of it uh, we want to modulate and what aspects of it we want to let be steady. And the result of properly applying that uh, dynamics uh, is uh, natural sounding audio. Now we've taken it a step further. Um, we were introducing a, a, a converter product. Our first converter product was Antelope. You've done converter products in the past, um, you know, with, with Aardvark that were well received. 
uh, by end users. And, um, and now, you know, we, we've delved into it again in a new way. We're doing a, a, our first product is called Zodiac, and it's a D to A converter. And you're doing something interesting. You're, you're still using your clocking and, and our yes. clocking technology. Um, how, can you explain that process? Yeah, because the, uh, in order to get a great sounding D2A converter, you know, there's uh, broadly speaking three aspects to it. One is to choose the right kind of converter chip. Two is to have high quality analog circuits such as power supplies and amplifiers. And three is to have the right kind of clock. And that's, uh, you know, we don't have problems building high quality analog circuits. And we've, we have selected the best TA chip, which in my view is Bert Brown at the moment. And so now it's the, where we are bringing in tremendously, and which is making a difference, is, is the clocking circuit. Because using that same 64-bit circuit that carefully controls uh, the, the, the modulations of the timing of the sampling clock, uh, that's where the difference comes in. That's where you get that analog live sound, and that's where you are able to take a source such as a, a Macintosh computer. You know, I mean, as, as you know, Marcel, that all uh, Mac computers have an optical output. But uh, I mean, is anybody using that optical output? Most people don't even know it's there, <laughs> in my experience. And well, there's a reason for it. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea, but the, but it's a well-known fact that you take an optical audio and you apply it to uh, regular DAC and it just sounds horrible I mean, because the dispersion of the light and the fiber creates a, it, it, it softens the edges the transitions which aggravates the jitter and so when when an uh, you know uh, uh, SPDIF signal goes through toss link through the optical cable it, it gets so jittered out that the result is just not acceptable it's horrible